Um, what I want to do today is talk about some work that's uh, on the archive currently, uh, and most of the work that I'm going to talk about is described in more detail in that paper. Um, I have to thank my collaborators, in particular Simon Maskell, who's one of my colleagues in electrical engineering at Liverpool, who is one of the experts in uh, state estimation or efficient state estimation for classical systems. And some of the techniques I'll talk about are based on his work in uh, sort of surveillance reconnaissance uh, uh, problems. Um, I also need to thank uh, Kurt Jacobs, who's my long-term collaborator in the US, and the group at Southampton led by Hendrik Ulbricht, in particular Marcus Torosh, who, is, uh, who are doing the experiments, and Marcus in particular has, has helped me uh, sort of uh, fit what I would like to do in the theoretical side into the uh, context of the experiments. Um, so what, I want, what do I want to talk about? Okay, so first of all, I, I need to apologize to Pierre. Um, Pierre, when I arrived yesterday, Pierre said uh, he wanted this, this meeting to be about, mainly about the control side of things rather than estimation. Um, so, and the group of Southampton have, uh, use a particular type of optomechanics, which uh, Nikolai didn't go into, but I'll talk a little bit about. Then I'll talk about continuous measurement, which uh, Mar uh, Marco Giannone's uh, already spoken about, and then go on to the meat of the talk, which is the quantum hypothesis testing. How do you tell something is quantum mechanical as opposed to classical? And then I'll talk a little bit about Crucially, that the, uh, the backscattered light from that allows you to do a, a homodone detection, which is equivalent to a position measurement of a particle held within that, that, that potential well. So effectively, we're doing a continuously monitored cooling of the system. And they've managed to improve the cooling of the system by a factor of two or three, just by using a standard Kármán filter and an FPGA implementation thereof. So there's, there's, there's promise in that regard. Um, you, can simplify it, you can simplify it still. Okay, I'm a theorist. I like something nice and simple. And of course, if I'm being a real theorist, I can simplify it to that. Okay. So it's a nice, elegant, elegant demonstration of a parabolic mirror with a trapped nanoparticle held within the potential well. This simple, elegant formulation allows me to also represent a more general system, like the one that Nikolai talked about. We get a cavity to the size of an atom. Okay. So they're pushing the boundary of what's practical to actually think of it as a massive object, and by cooling them down to sufficiently low temperature, you should start to see quantum effects within the, 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 the behavior of the system. Uh, the lowest reported temperatures I could find, or if I, uh, Hendrik uh, told me, is about 450 microkelvin, um, which is the Zurich. Uh, private correspondence that shows that some, some temperatures can be achieved, which is uh, probably about uh, order of magnitude better than that, but they, they currently haven't been published. So that's the sort of state of the art in terms of the temperature scale. And it's the temperature scale of 450 microkelvin is still far above where you would like to be to see quantum, the sort of quantum effects that you would normally be familiar with. So it's, the experiments are still a way away, but we're looking at how far we can push it. And in particular, we're trying to find out, well, what's the maximum temperature that we should still be able to see quantum effects in these systems? Okay? So by pushing the boundary up, we can hopefully meet the experiments as they prove and get the temperatures down. So continuous measurements, uh, Marco's already uh, talked about this in the last talk. Um, if you start with Schrodinger evolution, you have a quantum system that evolves quite happily under Schrodinger evolution. You add in an environment and then you probe the environment and you end up with something like an unraveling. So for the, just the environment, you start with the master equation. By adding in a real-time measurement record uh, of the uh, environment and then integrating out, you can get the stochastic master equation and a lot of different unravelings thereof. Uh, particularly, I should mention uh, Belavkin, uh, who did all of this work in Russian before the rest of us, were, in fact, before some of us were born. Um, and uh, there's a very good textbook now uh, by Howard Wiseman and Jared Milburn that goes into this in a lot of detail. So what we end up with is a modified... Quant oh, sorry. The, uh, by putting, in fact, it's not a single environment. Because we're making the Markov approximation, we actually use a sequence of environments uh, where each environment is replaced by a new environment so that correlations don't build up between the quantum system of interest and the environment. So it's a Markov approximation, which is re it's a simplification, but um, it's a re reasonably good one in most cases. Um, so we end up with a... Uh, a modified quantum evolution, so it's a, a modified Schrodinger evolution, which is the stochastic master equation, and some measurement record. 
And I've already mentioned Howard and Jared's textbook, but my collaborator, Kurt Jacobs, also likes me to mention the fact that there is also other textbooks available. Okay? So please, please buy his textbook. All right. So hopefully most of you are familiar with the stochastic master equation, which in this case is for uh, an efficient measurement, so E3 equals 1, corresponding to a Hermitian operator Y, and you get the standard unraveling of the master equation. Crucially, you get a measurement record which represents the, the, the photo current or the measurement that you're taking from the system, and then from that you infer the properties of the system. Um, now, this is normally... Oh, sorry, yeah. So, okay, so I'll come back to that point in a minute. Um, crucially, in the last few years, people have started to do experiments with these systems and actually me make continuous quantum measurements of experimental systems. The, the first one that I'm aware of is the one that was on the front cover of Nature by Siddiqui's group, um, where they re reconstructed qubit trajectories uh, from uh, a continuous measurement record. And then there's uh, the group in Paris, which is uh, Campagne Arbach, I think. I can't pronounce his name. Uh, where they did a similar thing, and both sets of experiments, I think, were on superconducting transmon systems. Uh, so superconducting systems are obviously fairly well developed these days. Um, but crucially, people are starting to do the experiments. Okay? I've worked in quantum control for a number of years now, and I've tended to work on quantum control in a thing called rapid purification. Rapid purification is one way to manipulate the measurement strength by manipulating the state of qubit or qubits. Okay? This is started by... Um, Kurt Jacobs and people like Josh Coombs and other people have done work on it. Now, that's great. That's a, a nice illustration of quantum, uh, a quantum speed-up effect where you can uh, project something or purify something quicker than you would otherwise be able to do by using feedback control. Unfortunately, uh, Birgitta Whaley's group uh, showed that to get that quantum speed-up, then you need to have at least a measurement efficiency of at least 50%. Okay? Below 50%, you get no speed-up whatsoever. And unfortunately, the experiment, the current state-of-the-art experiments are all below that level. So the, the current experimental setups are the efficiency is insufficient to actually be able to do those sort of those quite nice, simple, rapid purification protocols. So you think, well, is there, a, is there something else you could do instead? So we've, for the last couple of years, we've looked at how we can uh, develop quantum uh, estimation and quantum uh, feedback methods to... Um, to verify certain properties of quantum systems using these quantum uh, uh, trajectory methods um, and match them to experiments. So we've done some work on quantum chaos for the uh, superconducting group. And in this case, we're talking about stuff for the uh, levitated, uh, levitated uh, optomechanics experiments. Um, so that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing. So what we'd like to be able to do is just sort of give them a rapid purification protocol and then to them, the experimenters to just go away and do it. They can't do it because the efficiency isn't there in the experiments. So efficiency is a big problem with the, um, uh, with potentially with quantum control. Um, so why is inefficiency so problematic? Uh, the reason is that you're losing information. Inefficiency is down to either some of the information you're collecting from your measurement is being lost, or your measurement record is being otherwise corrupted by extraneous or other types of measurement, uh, measurement noise which is getting into the system. So you can imagine having your sort of very cold quantum system at the bottom of a, a, um, a cryostat. You take it up the chain of amplifiers, and by taking up the cha chain of amplifiers, other noise gets introduced into the system. And that causes, that's part of the cause of the inefficiency. The crucial thing with an inefficient measurement is that when you purify a system, it doesn't, get, it doesn't become completely pure. It will stay mixed, and it will stochastically evolve in such a way that that mixture level will vary as a function of time. So, but that's why, that's why um, inefficient measurements are a, are a problem. You're losing information about the system. The system is still being disturbed by the measurement, but you're not making use of all of that measurement that's available, the, the information that's available. Okay. Um, a quick aside, because in addition to my, the quantum work that I do, I also work, because I work in electrical engineering, I also work on classical state estimation. And classical state estimation is a very mature field. Uh, many people will have heard, hopefully heard of the Kalman filter. Many people would have heard of optimal Bayesian methods. Uh, Marco mentioned them a couple of times. Um, they're very good, but the Kalman filter is, in fact, very, very good. It's very good for most systems which are fairly linear. 
Okay? Even um, where you wouldn't expect a Kalman filter to work, the Kalman filter does work, and it does work well. Um, optimal Bayesian, in general, are intractable because the, the combination, the combinatorial uh, explosion of uh, possibilities within classical filtering, classical state estimation, mean that it becomes intractable very quickly. So computationally, it's, it's very complicated. So people in classical state estimation have developed methods to avoid uh, that combinatorial explosion. And these methods are, are being used in practical systems, things like the um, uh, PhD filter, particle filters, SMC methods that I'll mention, and things like multiple hypothesis filters, and they all have their place. The thing is that just going for the top, the optimal one, and going for the bottom, the Kalman filter, isn't necessarily the best bet. There's a whole range of techniques in between the two, and that's, that's a list of some of them. So the top techniques tend to be computationally expensive. The bottom techniques are simple, but they tend to not be that, uh, that um, accurate in terms of the um, filtering. Oh. So in, in classical systems, what they're doing is that they're, they're, estimating this, the, uh, they're estimating the dynamical quantity, quantities associated with, with objects, position, velocity, acceleration, mass, possibly even drag in air, on an airframe, airframe controllers even. Uh, so these are, these are very, um, very mature techniques which are widely used in engineering, and I can recommend a very good review article there. So you have these things, and the ones that I'm going to talk about today, very briefly, are called sequential Monte Carlo filters or particle filters. And there's a slight overlap there, because particle filters are probably the most commonly known uh, type of SMC method, um, but they are slightly different. General SMC methods have uh, slightly different properties. And people have, actually, it goes back to, um, I think, a paper by Stockton and someone else, who was the first one I've seen where they used a particle filter in a quantum context. So it has been, it has been uh, noticed by people, but it's not in common use because of the tendency to go for optimal Bayesian, because, well, optimal Bayesian has to be the best because it's optimal. Um, but there's a, there, there's a huge difference between what's actually used in engineering for practical situations, which tends to be at the lower end, and what you can do and publish papers on, which tends to be at the upper end. So classical state estimation filters, all of those techniques work in effectively the same way. You take a measurement, you compare the measurement with the expected measurement based on your current estimate of what the state is doing, and that gives you a thing called the innovation. The innovation is the difference between what you measure and what you expect to measure. If you measure, if you make a measurement and it's exactly what you expected, you've learned nothing from your measurement. All it's done is confirm something you already knew. So new information comes in through this, this calculating, comparing the difference between an actual measurement and an expected measurement. You use that information to then update your estimate of what the state is of the system, position, velocity, and so on, and then predict forward using a dynamical process, and then go back to the step. So you measure, you, up, you, you, measure, you compare, you update, you predict. You measure you compare, you update, you predict. Okay? That's the way all of these techniques work. In fact, but that's not the way that typically when you see the SMs, SM, SME, the stochastic master equation, that's not the way that it's normally presented. In fact, the way it should be presented, I would say, is by saying, well, we have this measurement record, and what people talk about, the conditioned density operator, effectively is our, our guess, our best guess, of what the system is doing given the measurement that we've just taken. Normally, it's presented the other way around, where the, SMC is, the SME is normally presented first, and then as an afterthought, you say, and the measurement record is this. In practice, if you're doing this for real, you would take a measurement record, calculate the innovation, difference between your state, your expected measurement, and your, the, the, me the expected measurement from the state, and the measurement you've got, put the innovation into your SME, your stochastic master equation, and then calculate your update for the state. Okay? So it's the same process, but it's rarely presented in that way, which is why I'm stressing that point. There are close parallels, in fact, I don't, there are complete parallels between the, uh, the integration of the stochastic master equation and the way in which a classical state estimation filter works. Okay. So, model selection. What do I mean by model selection? 
What I mean is, if we go back to the, 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 the sort of graphical model, the schematic model where I have, where I have a modified quantum evolution of a system, and I have some measurement device that's recording a measurement record, in fact, I rarely have full information about that, what that dynamical process is. Okay? In some cases, actually, I don't know what that, that dynamical process is. I need to be able to estimate what the underlying dynamics is of my system and be able to infer what the system is doing purely from the measurement record. So in this case, we have some fog with my device, or Hendrik's device, sitting at the bottom of the cryostat or in a uh, cell, a very low temperature. And what I'd like to be able to do is take the measurement record and just say, given that measurement record, do I believe that the object that I'm looking at is a quantum mechanical device, a quantum mechanical object, or do I believe it's still classical? And as I lower the temperature, what I should find is that the thing starts to exhibit more and more of the quantum behavior. Okay? So that's what, we're that's what I mean by a, a model selection problem. Um, if you think back... So in this case, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to differentiate between a quantum SME or a classical stochastic differential equation, which governs the, the classical evolution of, a, of the, the equivalent system. Okay? But if you think about the way in which we would normally say, is it quantum mechanical, normally what we would try and do is cool it down far below the first excited state and start to see some sort of discrete spectrum. Okay? The discrete spectrum... Uh, within, a, a, within a, a quantum system is the first indication that we have that uh, the system is behaving potentially quantum mechanically. You can then do things like interferometry. Once it's sufficiently cold, you can actually do an interference experiment or you can do a superposition experiment or do something where you have things like avoided crossings. This was the famous uh, paper in 1999 in superconductivity, which changed the way that people saw quantum superconductivity and led to the superconducting uh, qubits, uh, which are now sort of um, fairly uh, ubiquitous. So there are different ways of doing this. You can do things, you can do other things. I've sort of gone through a mental process of listing all the different things, ways you can tell something's quantum mechanical. So you've got spectroscopy, you've got interfer interferometry, superpositions, uh, avoided crossings, um, thermodynamics. As you lower the temperature, you would expect classical system to obey equipartition, um, the equipartition equation, or the equipartition uh, the equation? No. The equi uh, equi 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 obey the equipartition of energy. So you'd expect the energy for each degree of freedom to be a half kT. Uh, if it was quantum mechanical, then obviously it would obey the Boltzmann distribution. In fact, the graph shows the, uh, the uh, equipartition and the uh, Boltzmann distribution average energy against 1 over temperature, the dashed lines, and then the, for my two models, the quantum SME and the classical SDE, they're the, they're the sort of the average results. They're still fairly noisy, but you can get the idea. So as temperature reduces, or you move to the right on that graph, you can see there's clear separation between the classical and the quantum model. So by monitoring the thermodynamics of the system, you can differentiate between the, um, the two systems, the two models, uh, quantum and classical. You could look for um, uh, correlations within some state. So you can do some sort of tomographic type experiment. Okay? They're difficult to do, but you know, obviously tomographic experiments will give you more, um, uh, more information. Or you can do something like entanglement witnesses that show correlations, the existence of correlations, but don't measure the correlations itself. There are lots of different ways. And if anyone can come up with other, any other ways to differentiate between quantum and classical systems, I'd, I'd like to know them. What I'm going to talk about today is differentiating between the, qu the quantum and the classical models purely based on the dynamical evolution of the system. So it's how the, the dynamical evolution of my model that I infer from that measurement record, uh, allow, uh, um, how the, what, what the dynamical measurement record tells me about the evolution of the system. Okay. And this is, in, classical, in the classical world, this is a sort of bread and butter. This is a standard uh, problem that you have to deal with in classical state estimation. Uh, you have a black box, and you have to try and work out what's in the black box. This is sort of uh, bread and butter for the sort of the radar tracking in the aircraft identification community. The maneuverability in, of the aircraft tells you something about what type of aircraft that is. The size of the radar return tells you about what type of aircraft it might be. Um, it, was it was studied in about 2012, 2013 by Manke Zhang. Manke Zhang has been... Um, been doing a lot of work recently, and this was one of, a nice idea where he was basically looking at how you, um, how you can define this type of uh, model, what we call model selection, 
as a quantum problem, differentiating between a quantum system and a classical system. Okay. Um, what he did in the 2013 paper that's listed there was he looked at all of the potential issues associated with model selection or quantum hypothesis testing. So, for example, I said I, I, want, I want to differentiate between a, a quantum model and a classical model, but I need to have those models. What if neither, what if neither model is correct? I need a method to be able to estimate the parameters and to construct models on an ad hoc basis from uh, the measurement record. So in principle, it's a bit much more complicated problem. You have things like systematic errors. What if one of your parameters is systematically wrong? Can you identify that within your um, processing chain? Um, possible that all of the models are incorrect. You get a probability of one rather than the other, but neither probability is correct. That's a possibility. Um, parameters can drift over time. I understand from talking to experimentalists that when you, when you twiddle a knob, the, the parameter values don't stay where you put them. Okay? They tend to drift over time. So you need the ability to be able to monitor the current parameters within your model and then update them based on uh, measuring that, that tendency to drift over time. And there could be ambiguity or un unobserved parameters in any system. So you can imagine uh, a modification of quantum mechanics, so something like the GR GRW model, where there are additional parameters that are, are not necessarily represented within your model. Okay. Um, and that particular one, the, the, the systematic errors and the, the, as parameters drift over time, it overlaps with problems of parameter estimation. And that's the new stuff that isn't in that, that original archive paper. And I'll, tell, I'll sh show you some results that we've got on that recently. So, OK, just uh, looking at the time. Um, OK, so the way in which classically we would uh, quantify the ability to differentiate between two things. Normally in classical um, decision theory, you, uh, in engineering, you, uh, calculate, you tend to calculate two things. One is called the confusion matrix. The confusion matrix, if you can say that the, the, the prob if you have a, a, a diagonal um, confusion matrix where the probability of a picking a classical model given that it's classical is one, and given that the, probabil and, uh, the probability that it's quantum given it's quantum, Right. So the, you choose a quantum model given its quantum is one, everything's fine. But in practice, there'll always be a little bit of confusion between those two models. So the off-diagonal elements represent the types of errors that you get in your system. The confusion matrix is important because it's quite often a, a, a value that's quoted, but in fact, a better way to do it is a thing called a receiver-operator characteristic curve, or a rock curve, which is used in pattern recognition and radar theory to vary a threshold parameter, and it actually sweeps out a curve for each of those values of the confusion matrix. Okay? I'm not going to talk about the rock curve, but there are better ways to, to analyse these results. And in particular, what I'm going to do here is I'm only going to calculate the confusion matrix for a probability of a half. Okay? So if, it's, if the probability of, being pro a probability of being quantum is above a half, I say it's quantum. If the probability is below a half, I say it's classical. Okay? But there are these other ways to characterise the performance. That's the important thing. Right. So what Mankai Zhang did when he first looked at this problem was that he just looked at a simple, the simplest possible case, a linear harmonic oscillator, and said, well... Can we do this? Yes. Okay? It's fairly straightforward to do. The problem is that the linear, the, the linear potential, uh, linear harmonic oscillator potential, it only has a single well. Um, the maximum distinguishability, even at very low temperatures, between the quantum and the classical model with, with fixed parameters, is only about 80%. So it's only about, it's only about 8 out of 10 times you get it correct. Um, and it only works at very low temperatures. So the first question we asked was, is this as good as it gets? In fact, it would be disappointing if that, was the, if that was the case. In fact, it's not. We looked at a number of different configurations for potential wells, and the best, distinguish, best distinguishability turns out to be uh, where you have multiple wells. Okay? So this is where the um, Nikolai's uh, graphs of the double well thing comes in. Double wells are the, ca the case that we've got in, got in the archive paper, and crucially, it has to be a double well with these properties. The wells need to be sufficiently well separated for the measurement interaction to be able to distinguish which well it's in. It needs to be um, the lowest, the ground state needs to be just below the barrier, and the first excited state needs to be just above the barrier. And the reason for that is because you want the classical system to be able to be localised, so the classical system will rattle around in one of the wells, 
and then flip over, rattle around one of the wells and flip over. But the quantum system cannot be localised in one or other of the wells. It's sufficiently spread out that it has to delocalise across both wells. Okay. So they're, the, they're the, um, the criteria that we've established. And the reason why it can't, the quantum system can't localise in one, of the, one or other of the wells is because if you look at a bistable potential, a double well, if both the, first, the ground state and the first excited state are um, below the barrier, then the ground state is a symmetric superposition of being in both, and the ex first excited state is the anti-symmetric combination of both. So you can create a super excited state. That is not possible with this sort of configuration. The quantum system is always delocalized, and that's the critical thing. It's sufficiently deep so that the, the classical system can be localized, but sufficiently uh, weak so that the quantum system can't be, or sufficiently um, shallow so the quantum system can't be. Okay. All right. So these are the models. Um, equivalent models, there are a number of different parameters in here. Uh, um, unit mass, uh, there's a linear potential, which is the inverted bit of the, the double well, in this case, so it's omega squared. There's a, a mu nonlinearity parameter, and there's some sort of drive parameter G. Okay, so there's three parameters. There's also three types of noise introduced into the system. One from the measurement, which is the uh, Lindblad uh, L1. There's two for the thermal environment, uh, L2 and L3. And then in the, in the classical system on the right-hand side, it's the same process. You have three noise sources. The three noise sources in the classical system are the, uh, the back action or the, the, the increased noise due to the measurement, which is that one, and the thermal noise due to the environment, which is that one, and then the normal measurement noise that you put onto the measurement record. Okay, so again, three noises in both cases. And in the case of the quantum system, I'm assuming that the, or we're assuming that the, the uh, thermal environment is completely unprobed, so the efficiency is zero. Okay? So we're only looking at the first, the efficient, the measurement of the position itself, which, as I said, comes from a homodyne detection of that backscattered light, which can actually be very, very accurate. Okay? So they're the, they're the two models, and I want to be able to distinguish between those two models. Um, very quickly, because I haven't got much time, I'll go through uh, particle filters and sequential Monte Carlo methods. Particle filters and SMC methods are ways to choose possible candidate solutions for a classical system. So it could be a parameter within a, an evolution equation. It could be uh, the position or, or momentum or position or velocity of a particle, uh, a, in the case of particle filters, or a particular solution. And basically, what the SMC method does is it allows you to efficiently, efficiently select those parameter values. Okay? And it can be demonstrated, and one of the examples that I've got a bit later, when I've calculated multiple parameters, the, it can be demonstrated that it's significantly more, significantly more efficient than just doing a sort of a, a brute force and ignorance uh, grid-based approach on parameter values. Okay? So, and as I said, this, this field is quite mature within classical state estimation. So in this case, I have my measurement record, which is a series of measurements between time, t, time zero to time t prime. And I put my measurement record into my, S, uh, my, my SME, I put it into my SDE, and I evolve the system using that measurement record and that update in the same way in both things. And what I end up with is I end up with a probability or a relative probability between those two models, which are represented by these quantities here, which is the probability of getting that measurement for that model, probability of getting that measurement for that model. So this is the probability of getting that measurement for the quantum model, the probability of getting that measurement for the classical model, which is given by, in this case, by these Gaussians. And then I put those values into an update equation, these, which compares the relative probability of, get it, of the, the system being quantum and the system being classical. Okay? So there are only relative probabilities for these two models, but basically by normalizing them, okay, obviously the probability has to add up to one, starting with a uniform prior, I don't know which one it is, um, I can basically I can iterate this thing as I collect the measurement information. I can those those probabilities of being one or the other will will move between the two, and eventually they will settle down and decide that one is the case. A um, few uh, computational uh, issues there. The in the case of the SME, it's a moving basis, uh, 50 uh, to 100 states, and a simple harmonic basis with non-commuting noise sources because Pierre's told me off about that in the past. 
um, and I'm used Pierre's uh, numerical method for doing that. I found with Pierre's uh, method that was originally with uh, Nina and someone else, um, it's about four or five times better than the standard Milstein ap approach to um, solving the SME. So I definitely recommend that. For the classical system, I've got about 250 to 500 separate solutions, each of which evolves, and then I reselect those uh, according to the SMC method. Okay. Again, I haven't got time to go through that in much detail. So quickly say this is... Uh, this is the uh, original one. The important thing about these type, this type of update for the SME is that they guarantee positivity, and in that case, it allows you to do the second-order Milstein terms uh, with inefficient measurements. So I could definitely recommend this as a, a method for doing uh, numerical integration of stochastic master equations. Um, this is an example of evolution. This is a number of cases. I'll explain what this is. On the, the left-hand side, you have the probability of being quantum. Okay, so as it goes up, it's more likely to be quantum. As it comes down, it's more likely to be classical. These are, this in the middle is the distribution of particles for the classical state. There's a blue one here, which a blue ring here, blue ellipse, which is the, dis, the, the size of the quantum SME state. And the, 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 um, the red ellipse here is the, is the covariance ellipse for the uh, distribution of particles. And then there's a magenta, which is the actual evolution of the system. If it's magenta, it's the, the actual model is classical. If it's cyan, the actual model is quantum. And eventually what I do is, by running this multiple times, you eventually build up this confusion matrix. Okay. So as it evolves, you can start to see what's happening. This is a classical system, it's magenta. And you see every now and again, the magenta thing will start to localise to one of the wells. So it's just done it there. Okay, so it's there, it's, it's tightly wound around one of the wells. And you see that the blue ellipse for the size of the quantum state from the SME never shrinks into one of those states. And that's what I say about the fact it has to be delocalized in quantum, but ability to localize in uh, classical. And as you can see, it's just choosing, I was about to say it's choosing the wrong thing, but now it's choosing the right thing. Okay, so it's deciding it's not quantum mechanical. Gets to 100 cycles puts one in the classical, classical column. That now this is a quantum example, where now it's cyan. So you now have three ellipses, where the, the cyan ellipse is the spread of the actual quantum state. And it's deciding quite nicely that it's quantum mechanical. Okay? If I run this forward, so I haven't got much time. Okay? You can see, as it's, I think it's about, I can't remember how many examples there are, uh, 20 examples. So here you can see how you can build up over time the the confusion matrix by testing, putting in a quantum model, trying to decide is it quantum or classical. You put in a classical model and trying to decide whether it's, it's quantum or classical. And you can build that up over time. Um, the one point I do want to make is that this is for 100 cycles of the natural cycle of the oscillator. You could do it for more cycles and you get better results. The problem is there's, there's computational limits to how, how, many, how many you can do as you extend the time, but also in experiments, it's that stability of those parameters. The parameters need to be stable over, over the period in which you're integrating. So there, there's issues there. But you end up with, by, but you can make this better by in, in increasing the, the number of cycles or having more information available for your um, decision process. Doing this a large number of times, I think we did it 100 times for each model, uh, uh, for each of the efficiencies and each of the temperatures, you start to see some, some trends developing is that a very low temperature, which is the top curves here, at very low temperature, the states and, and very high efficiency, efficiency of one, the states effectively they get 100% separation. So it's clearly distinguishable quantum and classical models. As the efficiency de decreases, as the efficiency decreases, then the probability of getting the right result, correctly differentiating between the two models, De deteriorates, but it doesn't deteriorate that fast. E you know, you're talking here, this is 10% efficiency there, and you're still at about 75-80% distinguishability at very low temperature. And as you increase the temperature, what you find is that the ability to distinguish also decreases. So and that's for um, probability of detecting classical when it's classical, and probability of detecting quantum when it's quantum. So basically what it tells you is that as long as your temperature is sufficiently low, and your efficiency is sufficiently high, you can always distinguish. 
but then you sort of you degrade as you increase the temperature and reduce the measurement efficiency. And if I were to plot that on a, on a, a, 2D, on a, a 2D slide, you get a, a picture that looks like that. So these are the regions within which uh, you can distinguish uh, the, two, the two models. So the green areas are distinguishable, the red areas are not distinguishable. And crucially, I've put the the energy level separations on this graph. So this is the separation, the energy level separation between the, the ground state and the first excited state, and this is the energy level separation between the ground state and the second excited state. So this is showing that for a sufficiently high efficiency, you can still distinguish quantum from classical behavior, even above, just above the, the uh, second excited state. So it's pushing the limit of where, where you can sort of uh, freeze this cat, basically. Okay. So that's the sort of, that's the, if you like, the big news. It's pushing the boundary of where you can start to differentiate the quantum and classical world. So hopefully making it easier for the experimentalists. We hope. Um, very quickly, since I've only got a couple more minutes. Um, so it, this is all based around the levitator optic mechanics. People have already, um, people have already got uh, double well, uh, multiple well uh, traps, which is nice. Um, Experimental parameters, we've, got, we've used typical experimental parameters and sort of moved them around a little bit. The problem with the temperature is the temperature really needs to be about one, one microkelvin, ideally, for this to work. Um, okay, not brilliant, but you know, we would hope that they'd be able to get there um, uh, at some point in the near future. Um, so anyway, so there, there are uh, experimental parameters in the, in the paper. Um, just very quickly, Part of what I said about the, the, the models is that if the model is incorrect or the parameter values are incorrect, then that, the probabilities you're estimating are incorrect themselves. The, the SMC methods and particle filter methods are, are already used in classical systems to estimate parameters. So you can extend this model for a classical and a quantum to a classical with a parameter, quantum with a parameter, and you just use the same method. You just add the parameter value into the state of the system. And you can do that with the classical system very simply, because your state of the system is now your position, your momentum, and your parameter value. For, a, for a, uh, an SME, it becomes more problematic, but we have demonstrated that with what's called, what we call hybrid SMEs, where this is, uh, I won't show that movie, but basically we've shown this technique does work. In this case, it's the, it's, this is the SMC method in this paper, which shows that we can simultaneously uh, estimate three of the, the uh, important parameters within a, a nonlinear potential: the linear, linear, um, linear, parameter, linear uh, frequency parameter, the nonlinear parameter, and the driving, the magnitude of the driving term, simultaneously just from the data in a quantum system, okay, or a quantum measurement record. So uh, it does work, and it's simple to generalize from uh, a model to a model with a parameter. And this is, I think, an example of that being the case. This is a quantum model with now with a parameter estimation, which is the middle on the left. Okay, this is the settling down to um, where all of the particles now are condensing into the middle value where the, the parameter value is. Okay, so it does work. And if you're interested, I can show, show more movies. I've got lots of movies. Um, and in this case, very simply, you just effectively just do the same thing that we talked about in terms of the calculating the relative probability, but now you're estimating the, the, the uh, classical parameter alongside the, um, uh, the probability of the being one or the other. So in this case, it's, as I said, it's just a simple, ex a simple extension of what I've, what I've been talking about. Okay, so in this case, this is a quantum model, and it's estimating, in this case, the nonlinearity uh, no, so in this case, this is it's estimating the linear frequency parameter. In this case, I did have another example that in, in, uh, estimates the nonlinearity, but basically it works and it works well. It's a simple ex extension, as I said. So, just finishing on time. Um, so what I've done is I've talked about what we're trying to do is we're trying to lift the temperature at which we can determine whether something is quantum mechanical, and differentiate between a quantum and a quantum mechanical and a classical system. Uh, stochastic master equation is a natural way of doing this because it's very similar to the way in which we in engineering would use a classical state estimator. Um, we've optimized Manke Zhang's idea of quantum hypothesis testing to find the sort of uh, potential to differentiate between the quantum and the classical model. A key thing for the, for the experimentalists to, to note, and I keep, keep banging on about this, is measurement inefficiency is a critical parameter. Okay? 
it is important not only that, we, that measurement efficiency is as high as possible, but also that it's written, it's actually listed in the parameters of the experiment. Okay, because without that parameter, it's very difficult to actually ask to do this, this process. You need to have a fairly robust idea what the inefficiency is to be able to do this uh, differentiation between the models. Um, applied it to a particular example in qu uh, for quantum behavior in levitation optical mechanics. And in particular, what we've shown is that you can, you can differentiate between the two models above the temperature that you would normally expect to. So well above the, or slightly above the, um, uh, the second excited state. So that's nice. It's sort of pushing the uh, regime of quantum behavior uh, up rather than pushing it down. And it has a simple, a simple uh, extension to parameter estimation, which solves a lot of the systematic bias problems that, that Mankei Zhang listed in his paper. Okay. Thank you.